Hello and welcome to today's webinar on finding your ancestor in American fraternal organization records. My name is Ginevra Morse, Director of Education and Online Programs here at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer this webinar today for our members and friends around the world. And giving today's presentation is Rhonda McClure, Senior Genealogist at NEHGS. Rhonda is a nationally recognized professional family historian and lecturer specializing in New England and celebrity research, as well as computer genealogy. She's been here at the Society for about 10 years and helps patrons and members at our research library and archives in Boston. Her areas of expertise include immigration and naturalization, late 19th and early 20th century urban research, New England, Midwest, Southern, German, Italian, Scottish, Irish, French Canadian, and New Brunswick research. So in the next 45 minutes or so, Rhonda will go over some of the different types of fraternal organizations that exist, how to identify what organization your ancestor may have belonged to, how to locate the that society's records and what information they might contain. Of course, in 45 minutes, we won't be able to go through every fraternal organization that ever existed. So we will try to keep our research tips and strategies uh, pretty general. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to type a question in the panel to the right of your screen and Rhonda will answer as many as she can in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour. Again, we will select questions that are more general in nature, so please consider that when submitting your query. There is no handout for this lecture, but this event is being recorded and you can easily go back and review uh, that video. So don't worry if you miss something on the first listen, uh, you can always go back and rewatch, pause, fast forward, or rewind the presentation. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Rhonda. Good afternoon, everyone, and I am so excited to be able to be with you all virtually and talk about fraternal organizations. It's something that has always been an interest of mine, and I love the fact that more and more we're seeing some of these records come available. So first, we'll give a little overview of the fraternal groups and some of the ideologies, then we'll talk about ultimately the records and how to get them and so forth. So let's first talk about why our ancestors joined fraternal groups. Well, we have to think in terms of the fact that people weren't on top of each other like they are today. We don't have like skyscrapers and a lot of people were in rural areas. So there was a camaraderie that they were looking for certainly, but also a support network. Uh, these groups were designed to help uh, the individuals themselves, the men, and maybe if he died, maybe help the widow or the children, etc. Many of them came with insurance benefits as an uh, a bonus so that they had a, you know, maybe a death policy that would help uh, with the expenses of burial or would be given to the wife or a surviving beneficiary. Many of them required you to have some belief in a supreme being of some sort, so there was definitely a religious support. Uh, others uh, offered a chance to do service for others, and this we see more with uh, how they, a lot of the fraternal groups have changed over time into present day. And some of them, especially the ethnic ones, it was a ties to the old ways or the old country. So it was often where the immigrants would learn about how to become American and in the naturalization process and things, it was done within their organization. For the purposes of uh, today's lecture, we're going to group our types of organizations and I will go through uh, the various types, uh, explaining why, what the focus was. Uh, fraternal groups is just sort of a catch-all term for a lot of different groups. So the various types of uh, societies, some were literally just social, you get together, you, you know, there were drinking clubs, etc. And that was the whole focus was pretty much to get together and have a good time. Uh, there are benevolent or service organizations, the ethnic organizations were of course, geared towards those of a similar ethnicity, trade organizations were 
for those who were banding together, maybe for a uh, ability to, you know, go fight for certain rights or something, or just to have options that they didn't get at their uh, occupation. Uh, these do not include unions, and in fact, we will not talk about unions at all because those are really not considered fraternal organizations. Uh, but then also, you have your religious or your what they call your mystical societies, where the emphasis does seem to be more on the religion and the oaths and uh, and special qualifications and as you climb through the society's levels and it's geared more towards the religious aspects. As far as today's lecture goes, uh, we are not going to include lineage societies, although some do think of them as fraternal groups. Uh, basically, fraternal groups focus on ethnicity or occupation or uh, religious beliefs, etc. And except for the auxiliary uh, organizations for either the wives or the children, no familial relationship is really required to join a fraternal organization. Usually it has more to do with either your occupation, if it's one of the trade groups, or you have to believe in a, in a religious, you know, supreme being of some sort. Lineage societies such as the DAR, you know, Daughters of American Revolution, um, the Sons of the American Revolution, uh, descendants of witches, Mayflower descendants, etc. Their focus is on history. And in order to become a member of these groups, you must prove your blood relationship, your descent, to a qualifying ancestor based on whatever the focus is of that society. So that's a very distinct difference between the fraternal groups and the lineage groups, is that need to have a proven descent or blood relationship to a qualifying ancestor. So they really are a whole separate ball game from the fraternal groups that we're gonna talk about today. There are obviously some very common and well-known fraternal groups, and these are just a few of them. Uh, as we go on throughout today, you're gonna find that I mentioned quite a few different groups, and there are books on this subject, so there's no way I can mention every one of them, but some of them we will get to, and some of them are either still in operation or are no longer, uh, and I will let you know if it's something that's gone away. The ones that you see here, the Freemasons, sometimes more usually referred to as Masons, Knights of Pythias, the Maccabees, uh, the International Moose, the Elks, the Lions, the Redmen, Odd Fellows, Independent Order of Foresters, Ancient Order of United Workmen, the Grange, Kiwanis, and Woodmen of the World. These are all very common fraternal groups and they are all still very active today. Uh, obviously, unfortunately, some of their uh, memberships are dwindling. As we go more and more into our houses and live vicariously through our computers, they're finding it harder to get members, but all of these groups still are in operation today. We'll talk about a few of them uh, that are some of the founding of some of the bigger groups, but again, this is just the tip of the iceberg as far as what groups exist. Obviously, the most common is the Freemasons. There is a difference, a differentiation between what they call the operative Masons, which were the stone working actual Masons. They formed their own groups in the 14th century. They had their own secret handshakes. And basically it allowed a Mason to travel and to find shelter and things like that as he was going from town to town, plying his trade. He knew that he could find somebody else a mason who would offer him, you know, a night's lodging, maybe food, etc. What we see today in uh, the abbreviation of the F and A of masons, the free and accepted masons, is the accepted masonry, which was predominantly founded in the 1600s. This is accepted as in, these individuals are accepted as masons, although they are not stone cutters or masons as the uh, term of applies to occupation. So that's where the accepted comes in. However, while it was founded in the 1600s, it really didn't become truly active and important until the 1700s. So there are very few uh, lists or information about any of those who were in the 1600s. Obviously that was back in uh, the UK and predominantly in England at the time. Today, the Freemasons vary from country to country. 
Uh, they have also experienced a certain amount of uh, schisms over time. Uh, you have different rights, etc. And there's an an amazing graphic that I was able to find uh, online that kind of gives you the Masonic structure. Uh, and the reason that this is so important is that there are a lot of groups out there that you think are completely separate from the Masonic uh, umbrella, shall we say, but in fact are actually sects, like subsets of the Masons. So in other words, you have to be a Mason in order to become one of the other things, Knights Templar or Knights of Malta, etc. cetera. Uh, and those are based on the two known rites, which is the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. These are different approaches to the same ultimate item. Uh, you see in the example uh, in this graphic here that we have the compass and the square. These are very popular and um, recognized, well-recognized insignia for Masons. And you see them all over the place. You'll see them in tombstones, on cars, etc. So you have your compass and then you have your square. And of course, obviously this comes out of the, uh, the original Masons, the operative Masons, in that those were two tools of their trade. And you work your various levels. And so on the right hand side here, you can see the various levels going from the first level all the way up to the 33rd level at the very, very top, which is the highest level that you can reach in masonry. So, but this is a great view of the two different ones and how they sort of work together and some of the different chapters, etc. Another one that is still very active is the Knights of Pythias. And this one is unique in that it's, it's taking a Greek uh, connotation. There's a wonderful story uh, about the Knights of Pythias, uh, but it was actually not Pythias. It was a mistake in that word. And what it basically boiled down to was that they, uh, were founded in 1864 as a secret society for government clerks. They're basing uh, their kind of their beginnings on the story of Damon and Fintius, who uh, were uh, brothers and back in the Greek times. And the reason that it's called Pythias is it's actually a misreading of Fintius, one of the main people in the in the story. The basic story was that Pentius was condemned to death for opposing a tyrant and his friend and fellow member Damon is offering himself as hostage so Pentius could go and make farewells to his family. When it comes time for the execution of Pentius to draw near, he hasn't yet returned, so Damon offers himself up instead. And at the last minute, Pentius reappears, embraces his friend, and unfortunately, you know, he is due to lose his life, but Dionysus, who is the tyrant, is so impressed that the man came back and honored that, that he actually uh, releases both of them. So that was sort of their basis. And it was originally for this very, very small group of people. Now it's considered a fraternal organization with service aspects. What this means is that they are very big on doing things for others. And so many of the groups have special uh, either hospitals or foundations or things that are devoted to certain illnesses or specialties that they give service to. Their rituals and ceremonies have been officially published. What this means is they went out and published them and put them out there for the world to see rather than waiting for somebody to go in, you know, surreptitiously record everything they say and then tell about it. And this is something unique. They are the only one to have done this officially. The Odd Fellows uh, had its first U.S. Lodge in 1819 with the Washington Lodge number one. Boston followed in 1820 and Philadelphia in 1821. They were uh, coming over from England, it was originally uh, a British organization, and there was a huge split that happened in predominant in about 1843 that resulted in two branches. The Oddfellows, as it is known, is the British branch, 
and the independent order of Odd Fellows is the American branch. So if you see IOOF anywhere, that's the American branch. The schism, unfortunately, was over the fact that the uh, British branch had allowed an African-American uh, lodge to form. And the Americans, unfortunately, at the time did not agree with that. So that's where that schism came in. The Redmen is another interesting little group, and their official name is Improved Order of Redmen, and you will often see them abbreviated as IORM. It was founded in Baltimore in 1834. In its present form, it's a fraternal social insurance and political society. So they will encourage their members to go out and fight for political things that they believe in, et cetera. What's interesting about this organization is that it's, it, its aim is to perpetuate the beautiful legends and traditions of a vanishing race, AKA the Native Americans. However, up until 1974, they had an all white clause. In other words, only white men could become members of an organization that was to perpetuate legends and traditions of Native Americans. So you will find, unfortunately, and there's no way we can politically correct this, that there is a lot of racism that feeds its way into some of these organizations. One of the uh, interesting little tidbits about the Redmen is that the organization itself claims to have been founded in 1765 as a continuation of the Sons of Liberty. Uh, there's no paper trail for this, so you sort of have to take them at their kind of their word, but that's their saying is that, that that's where they come from. The Knights of Columbus uh, was founded the 29th of March, 1882 in New Haven, Connecticut. Originally, it was supposed to be just a fraternal insurance organization to offer support to widows and orphans, uh, and it is... Uh, a Catholic organization. Uh, nowadays, it's a fraternal insurance, religious, and patriotic organization. So it's it's got branches. You know, it's got its fingers everywhere. The reason that the Knights of Columbus is Catholic is because in 1738, Pope Clement XII uh, issued a papal edict denying uh, membership to the Masonic lodges to the Catholics saying that they would be automatically excommunicated if they did so. Uh, Pope John Paul II stated in 1983 that joining the Masons would result in being denied Holy Communion. Not quite as bad as excommunication, but still not great. So the Knights of Columbus became the answer to fraternal membership without com uh, committing a mortal sin. And so you will find even today that there's that, that sort of separation. Most of the time you're gonna see Catholics in Knights of Columbus, and you're gonna see uh, Protestants and some of the other groups. One of the things that um, I wanna call attention to is I'm gonna use the word lodge a lot, but that may not necessarily be the name for the group, the subgroups, the local groups for the particular um, uh, organization you might be interested in. For instance, the Knights of Columbus have courts and the, uh, the red men have wigwams. So all of these different groups have different names based on whatever the focus was of their organization. So you might see things like Aries, uh, the Eagles have, uh, are called Aries. The camps I said for um, uh, the, some of the others, there's tribes, there's courts, granges, nests, wigwams, uh, but for today, we're just gonna talk about them as lodges as we go forward. All right, there are some very uh, religious specific organizations that are out there. I've, I've mentioned just a handful of them. Some of the Jewish organizations are the B'nai B'rith and B'rith Shalom. Uh, Ahav Avas Israel is a defunct one, but it was a very popular one back in the 1800s, so you may find that you have that one, you know, your ancestors, if you had Jewish ancestors, may have been a member of that. Today, there's a couple of insurance ones that are still very active, B'nai Zion and Free Sons of Israel. 
uh, they are more just insurance, whereas the others are charitable and benevolent type associations that are doing things in addition to being fraternal groups. When it comes to the Catholics, we have already talked about the Knights of Columbus and they are definitely a charitable and benevolent. Uh, the Catholic Daughters of America is another one that is charitable and Catholic Association of Foresters. We're gonna talk about them a little later. Two of the insurance ones that all they did was offer insurance was the Catholic Knights Insurance Society and the National Catholic Society of Foresters. The Foresters, there's like three or four groups. So you have to make sure you have the right one when it comes to those. When it comes to African-American organizations, unfortunately, because of the racism that was prevalent in this time period, most of these groups were formed in the 1800s. Many times you find that the African-Americans had to create their own organizations. So you will see things such as uh, the Colored Knights of Pythias, which is the Knights of Pythias, but for African-Americans. Uh, the Improved Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks, the Elks as an overall at one point did not allow African-Americans, so they created their own. Uh, Grand United Order of Oddfellows as well. The African National People's Empire and the Colored Brotherhood and Sisterhood of Honor. These are just a few of them. Uh, so you may find that your ancestor as an African-American had to go and find his own uh, organization with other African-Americans because the one that he really tried to join was only was whites only at the time in present day that's no longer an issue the ethnic organizations uh these again just a couple of them the italian sons and daughters of america fraternal organization knights of equity this is practicing catholics who are of irish ancestry um, then there's the Ancient Order of Hibernia, which is an Irish, own, uh, an Irish one, Order of Sons of Italy in America, and the German Order of Harugari, which is German, obviously, uh, in its ethnicity. Again, there is, if there's an ethnicity, there's probably a fraternal group for them. There's Czech, there's Slovak, there's all sorts of groups. So you may find that your ancestor who was an immigrant joined one of those ethnic groups to acclimate himself to uh, being here in America. Occupational and military are some of my favorites, uh, predominantly because they give you an insight into perhaps the life of what it meant to be a railroad train man or to be involved in the lumber industry, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, the Brotherhood of Railroad Train Men was one of them. If any, many of the railroad occupations had their own separate brotherhoods. So you had your train men, you have your brake men, et cetera. The International Order of Hoo Hoo uh, sounds like a joke, but it really is a legitimate organization. It did start out as one of those drinking groups, uh, clubs. Ultimately, though, it, it, you know, stood up and decided to, to become an honorable, you know, fraternal group. But it was predominantly those who were involved in the lumber industry. So if you find something about, you know, the International Order of Hoo Hoo in your family history, your person was either involved like a, in wood cutting or somehow involved in the lumber industry. The Grand Army of the Republic is a defunct organization, but it was for Union soldiers, and we'll talk about it a little later as well. And then the Fraternal Order of Police uh, is still a very active one for those who are uh, police, uh, members of the police forces, etc. When it comes to our women, most of your women's organizations tend to be tied as an auxiliary to a men's organization. So if you've got, you know, Masons, then your women may have been Order of the Eastern Star. If your, you know, great, great, great grandfather was a member of the Odd Fellows, his wife may have been a Rebecca. One of the uh, groups that I was able to identify and is that is still active that was women's only and continues to be women's only is what's known as the Grail Movement. It was founded in 1940 as a women's organization and predominantly Christian women's group and uh, very free thinking, very, very 
positive movement, you know, to support womanhood, etc. And it is still an active and uh, viable group even today. Okay, we've talked a little bit about some of the groups, but the biggest thing usually is how do I identify the groups that my, you know, ancestors were members of? Well, one of the ways to do that is deciphering the acronyms, and I've given you a couple of those acronyms already but sometimes you may have artifacts like photos or jewelry or other ephemera uh, that has been handed down in the family um, and you don't know what it is but it may be the clue to groups that your ancestor was a member of and then of course there are often clues in the cemeteries on the tombstones so we're going to talk a little bit about how to identify some of those groups using various sources Obviously, published sources are our, our first go-to, or should be our first go-to. Uh, the abbreviations and acronyms, A Guide for Family Historians by Kip Sperry, which was published in 2000, has a lot of acronyms that are pertinent to what we do uh, just in general in genealogy, but also has many of the fraternal organization uh, acronyms included in his listings. So it's one of the ones that I check frequently uh, and you can find it in a lot of different libraries. But there are a couple of other published resources that give some background into the organizations um, and that includes the Encyclopedia of Associations, Natu National Organizations of the U.S., which was published by Gale Research in 1997. Secret Societies of All Ages and Countries by Charles W. Heckthorne in 1997. This one, he does have a bit of a thing about the Illuminati. Uh, so it's of my, of my go-tos, it's probably my third go-to when I'm looking into something. Uh, but it's certainly because he does other countries could be of use to you if you're researching your ancestors abroad. But my top one has to be uh, Alan Axelrod's The International Encyclopedia of Secret Societies and Fraternal Orders, which was published in 1998. He uh, has a wonderful uh, alphabetical listing of organizations, and he includes things that we wouldn't necessarily consider to be fraternal groups, but were secret in some way, such as the mafia, the Mormons, um, yeah, the Chinese triads, etc. Uh, so some of the organizations we may not want our ancestors in, uh, but he gives great background on when they were formed, uh, if there were schisms, if they joined other groups, etc. And as you can see here, we have an example of, from his book on the Improved Order of Red Men, which gives the address of the national lodge or whatever you want, you know, whatever they're calling their large national overview. Uh, it talks about when it was founded, if he knew, if they know. And because it was published in 1998, he often tells you how many members there were as of like 1995-ish uh, when he was originally writing this book. But then he often will give you information into some of the uh, oaths or the various requirements as they move up in their various levels. He often tells you all the different levels they have and sometimes what was required to, to join them. So it's a really good uh, book to have as far as the history and the real breakdown in a, in a small synopsis. Obviously, uh, fraternal histories themselves are where I often turn if I really want the true meat of a, of a group. So if it's a group that I have not been familiar with that all of a sudden appears in something I'm working on, I will look to see if there is a fraternal history. They will give you background and origins. They often will talk about some of the foundings of the various lodges, etc. There may be biographies in these types of books, but they tend to be devoted to those who served as officers in the various uh, local, state, and national uh, levels. So your average person who joined is probably not going to have a biography, uh, but if they, if the particular fraternal history goes into detail about the founding of different local lodges and your 
ancestor was a founding member, there might be something there. But really, only the movers and shakers at the top levels are going to have any kind of biographies listed. When I first got into uh, researching fraternal organizations, you know, everything was secret, secret, secret. What I discovered was the only thing that's secret is what goes on behind the doors once they go into their building. They love to announce that they are members of organizations. So one of the things I discovered was that there are catalogs from back in the day that we often can find either in libraries, museums, even digitally online that may offer clues to the various types of organizations, especially for jewelry and any kind of uh, pins and things like that. Uh, three of the big ones was the Sears Roebuck, Montgomery Ward, and the Blue Book. Finding these particular uh, catalogs uh, requires searching different places, um, they, but they do offer a variety of jewelry and other items that you could buy. Um, they tend to be obviously the, the older catalogs from the early 1900s, and um, some of those have actually been reprinted because people are interested in, that, in the history, so you want to search the internet and see if you can find digital versions. Also check eBay. Um, I actually purchased a couple of reprinted catalogs in digital format that were actually done via CDs back in the dark ages uh, that were being sold via eBay. And to give you an example of sort of what some of these look like, you'll see in the uh, Sears Roebuck that we have a number of charms uh, for different groups. And you'll see the charm and it will give you down below uh, the cost of it if you got it in gold or if you got it in you know some other variation. And what's nice about this is you get an, a name for the organization. So here we have the uh, Knights of Pythias and a Masonic because you have both the the square and the compass, but then at the bottom you have the three links, which is a, uh, an, uh, I'm sorry, an odd fellows, not Pythias, an odd fellows uh, symbol. Next to that is the Knights of Pythias, and then further over is the Grand Army of the Republic. So if you've got one of these pins that has something or a bracelet or a ring or something, you might actually find that you can look at one of these and discover what group your ancestor belonged to. I do want to point out, just because it sort of threw me the first time I saw it, this one here for the Elks, it is gold filled, but there is a tooth, an Elks tooth. Uh, and back in the day, they were real teeth from the animal. I think today they're no longer, I think they actually man manufacture them, but back in the day they were the actual tooths. So that kind of freaked me out the first time I saw it. But again, if you've got something that has a tooth attached to it, you're probably a member of something like the moose or the elks. The Montgomery Ward catalog is very similar in that it has many of the same examples of types of items. Uh, again, this one had like a royal plate or solid gold. So you had different uh, prices uh, that you they could right away in order and have uh, sent to them. These were catering to your individuals. So, you know, just like people would sit down with the old Sears Roebuck and catalog and say, oh, you know, I want a, I want a sled for Christmas. Similar kind of situation where they would order these things. One of the books that I found most useful, though, was the Blue Book which is actually the sales catalog for traveling salesmen who catered to the various general stores and variety stores across the country. So somebody could go in and purchase this at their general store after the owner of that establishment had ordered through the, the Blue Book. And again, they give us similar information. They show us the, the, uh, the various types of things that we might find on jewelry, etc. As far as a really great place to go online to check out some of the jewelry and other ephemera, I would have to recommend uh, Phoenix Masonry. 
uh, org. He's got two sections. He's got a Masonic version and then he has a other fraternal groups. Uh, and this is the page for his fraternalism in America, which is everything except Freemasonry. And what he does is he has oftentimes you can choose some of these sub uh, these topics and it will give you images of pictures and swords and, you know, ribbons and whatever your ancestor may have been into uh, in wearing in regalia for their organization. So it's a great place to, to go and check out things. Uh, and then sometimes just for fun, I will go to eBay and look and see what the the ephemera is that's on sale. Uh, a lot of people will go to various estate sales and take all the jewelry and things and then they'll sell that stuff on eBay. So you may find rings and things that, that were for groups that your ancestor belonged to that maybe you don't have but you would love to have and so maybe an estate sale uh, on eBay might be your answer. Keep in mind though that sometimes those who are doing the selling misidentify a particular item as being of one fraternal group instead of another. Uh, perhaps the most important area that we find things though is certainly the cemetery. Um, tombstones, because they last so long and because our ancestors were very passionate about their memberships in these things, we may find the clues there. Uh, sometimes there are cemeteries that were purchased by the fraternal group for its members to be buried in. Other cemeteries have sections set off for fraternal groups. And then there are city cemeteries where just the tombstones are scattered throughout that have clues to membership in these various organizations. You may need to, have to find the cemetery in question. Uh, books such as the one you see here, the Oregon Burial Site Guide, which was published uh, a while back, gives things such as the um, Cedar Hill Cemetery, which was also known as the IOOF Oakland. So if you saw something that said IOOF Oakland on a death record and you can't find that today, Cedar Hill is actually what you're looking for. Uh, sometimes you can find that on things like find, uh, find a Grave Now and other Google searches, etc. Uh, but books like this were, uh, are still available and should be searched whenever possible. When it comes to fraternal sections in cemeteries, I got to say they're obviously one of my favorites because everybody within that section is going to be usually a member of a particular lodge. In this case, in the Key West Cemetery, those who were buried in this section, which was has, uh, I'm, you can probably see just down towards the bottom of the picture here, that we have the iron links of the fence. Uh, everybody in the section that was, was linked off were members of the Dade Lodge number 14th of the Free and Accepted Masons. So this is something that at least gives me an answer to the lodge number, which is very, very important when it comes to looking for records. But more importantly, when you're in sections like this, you will often find uh, some tombstones that will say, you know, ere uh, erected by the lodge because so-and-so couldn't afford it, etc., which is always very heartwarming to me when I see that. The Grand Army of the Republic was a fraternal organization for honorably discharged soldiers of the Union Army. Uh, and everybody, when you hear Union Army, most people think Northern states. Well, here's the thing, the GAR could actually, they had groups that were in Southern states after the war ended. Uh, and a perfect example of this is the town of St. Cloud, Florida, which was actually founded as a GAR retirement community. Now, I happened to live in St. Cloud, Florida for a number of years, and I came upon newspaper articles advertising St. Cloud as the place to be for retirement, and it talked about it being this wonderful you know, place, and I'm like, you guys are all wearing wool, and we have 100% humidity 360 days of, out of the year. So I'm not sure how great that was going to be for them, but it was a southern city, and yet its whole purpose for existing was because it started out as a GAR retirement community. You will often find on the GAR the, this full insignia that you see here, the eagles, uh, the crossed guns of some sort, the flag, and then the five-point star. 
Uh, not all of them will do as this one has here where they actually tell you what organization they were a member of. Uh, and this tombstone was actually found in the St. Cloud uh, City Cemetery, but the gentleman in question was born in Heartland, Maine and was a member of the Maine Volunteer Infantry and yet died in Florida. So if you're looking for him, if you're looking for Charles Cook up in Maine, he's not there. The Improved Order of Redmen, uh, which we talked about earlier, is another one that has a couple of variations of their insignias. The one here is the breast of the, is the eagle with the, holding his little banner, and on his breast is T-O-T-E, which is a, nobody really knows what that means with the Redmen, but it is a no, it's like, if you see that, it's an automatic that the mem the person was a member of the, the Redmen. Uh, you may also see a tomahawk of sorts, That's a, and usually that's a flag holder that might be beside a grave. Uh, now, we talked about how the Knights of Columbus is a Catholic uh, organization, so usually you would expect to find all of your Knights of Columbus in a nice Catholic cemetery. That's not always the case. This person here was uh, uh, buried in a city cemetery, even though there were, you know, Catholic churches around, there was no actual Catholic cemetery. So they ended up in the city cemetery. Now the insignia on the left is the re more recognized uh, Knights of Columbus that we saw earlier. And the one on the right here indicates that he had reached the fourth degree. Uh, but if you didn't know that, you might think, oh, this is a whole other fraternal group that I have to go out and search for. So this is where understanding the various insignias that may be on the ephemera and uh, the rings and things plays a part because they may show up on your tombstones and may be harder to identify. Uh, again, that Phoenix Masonry site is my go-to whenever I find a new thing as far as a picture goes. The grain, the Grange is actually, no, its official name was the National Grange, the uh, Order of the Patrons of Husbandry, but everybody knows it as the Grange. It was founded in 1867 in Fredonia, New York, allegedly to help the South recover from the Civil War. It's considered a fraternal trade society, uh, and it catered to small uh, farmers and their families. And like may, many of the others, it's based on Masonic beliefs. Uh, some of you may already be aware of that one in that it is uh, mentioned frequently in Little House on the Prairie. Charles Ingalls is actually a member of the Grange. The Knights of Pythias is a, we talked about, and here you can see they have uh, the crossed swords and there's a um, the knight's helmet. You may see their motto, FCB, Friendship, Chariot, and Bene uh, Charity and Benevolence. Then uh, the last sample I have for tombstones is actually somebody who was a member of two groups, in this case, the Masons and the Odd Fellows. We have the compass and the square, and then below that, the three links, which is the Odd Fellows. Uh, their motto was friendship, love, and truth. It's very common for people to have joined more than one organization. So now that we've identified the organization that our person is from, let's talk about finding some local lodges. We need to keep in mind that there is a hierarchy to the lodges, the tents, the encampments, whatever it was. So you have your local ones that are at the town and city level. You have your state grand lodges, and then you have your national or supreme lodges. Usually it's more important to identify the local lodge because that's where your ancestor joined and that was who he interacted with. So let's talk a little bit about some resources on finding local lodges. There are published books, um, especially county histories and things, city directories, newspapers, and then even society organization or other websites might give you information as to local lodges that existed in various areas. County histories vary from, you know, book to book as to what kind of information you might find. This particular one on Knox County included very uh, uh, 
a, a lot of different secret societies, uh, mentions many of the leaders in the organizations and the when they were founded. It's one of the few that also included um, the founding members in their uh, in the county history. So if you know you were a brother of railroad brakemen, you might find your guy as a member when it was founded. I usually turn to the city directories when it comes to working with any large city, not only to find out how many lodges were there, but also to get an idea of where they were located so that I can get a sense of what's the closest one to where my ancestor was living. And then newspapers can be also a great resource. Uh, sometimes you may see an actual announcement, such as the one here, Brother Simon Sickles, who was the combative secretary of Boone Lodge. Remember, those lodges are important, uh, is quite indisposed. The absence of Brother Sickles is much to be regretted as the meetings are chaotic without him. No doubt why he was the combative secretary. But more importantly, in the newspapers, you may actually find when and where the lodges are meeting. Again, because newspapers abbreviate things, this is where it's really important to know the acronyms before you start working on that. Okay, so we have identified our local lodge. Next steps, bringing that current to present day. You want to look at current city directories, telephone books, uh, the web, and see if that lodge still exists today. If so, you want to start by contacting that existing local lodge and see if you might be able to receive some copies of records. Um, you always want to start on the on the local level, if at all possible, because the further up you go, the less the more removed they are from your ancestor. So let's talk about our records for a moment here, because we've identified our lodge, we have figured out where we're going. Uh, where are we going to turn for some of these records and how, what are we going to find in them? So first off, when it comes to looking for the records, uh, books by the organizations or about the organizations can help you. They often, such as Alan Axelrod's book, give you uh, addresses for the national level. The internet may have things for you about contacting lodges or camps. They may even have transcribed or digitized records, repositories such as Family History Library uh, and other libraries and archives. Uh, turning to the, the local lodge obviously is a go-to, uh, but when you're going up the ladder, so to speak, there's the state level grand lodges, national level fraternity repositories, many of them have museums or uh, uh, libraries attached to them, state level libraries and archives, so the Massachusetts State Library might have something. Um, university libraries, if they're manuscript collections, and they usually are, if a lodge closes, they may turn over those their records to a local newspaper, uh, a local university, or other uh, manuscript repository. So you definitely want to check those as well. Records. Uh, as far as what you might find, information about your members. Uh, if they don't have insurance options in the fraternal group, you're not likely to find any family history or parents' names. It's only when we're dealing with death benefits that we often find any information about beneficiaries or death certificates that give us info about the family, like the parents, etc. cetera. Uh, keep in mind these records are considered private and organizations don't have to share. Again, let me reiterate that not all records are available to the public. However, the internet is a good place to start. I often have just gone out and done Google searches of a particular county and the uh, type of fraternal group I'm looking for and you may find uh, something along these lines. This happens to be a book that I was able to discover and was able to get at a library. And so it gives you information about the various members, but what the meat of the book was had to do with those who had died and their, their associations and where they died, the cemetery that they were located in, and then various uh, miscellaneous notes that may have been found in you know, a newspaper or something to that effect. All very critical information for uh, doing research. As I mentioned, 
the lodges themselves may have something such as a library and museum. And in the case of the Grand Lodge of Texas, uh, we can see that they actually have a genealogy section. So how, you know, there's a fill in the blank form that you can use and a um, uh, over on the right, you see where there's Masonic genealogy, etc. So you have options there. Keep in mind that if you're going to ask for family information, they may blow you off. It's better to ask about membership information. That's the type of thing that they're likely to have. And to give you an example of that, we have uh, the Massachusetts State Lodge allowed us to digitize the their index cards for the Massachusetts Masonic Lodges. Uh, and here we have my grandfather, Thurlow Everett Eyre, who was residing in Somerville. This is the type of information that the Masons know, the, or that the Lodges know if they're not an insurance group. They know very little about his, you know, origins other than where he, where and when he was born. Nothing about his parents or anything. Doesn't mean that you don't want this information because it, it was supplied by your ancestor and may be more accurate than info that you already have. But there are other resources that are available, um, such as, you know, here's a list of the Grand Army of the Republic uh, membership and when you click on one of these items you get an actual biographical write-up about the person and may give you information or may point you in a different direction from what you had done uh, what you knew previously so you never quite know what you're going to come across sometimes it's very basic information such as the one from the electric cemetery which uh, we have next uh, it's just a list of those who were buried and the records of when they were, you know, what they have there, the GAR records or something. Never assume that they won't have what you want. Check it out and see what they've got. And in this case, it actually tells us that the records are just are housed in the Oklahoma Historical Society. So you want to check these out, see where things are. The Foresters, as I mentioned, were an insurance group, and Tiara, which was is the Irish Ancestral uh, Research Association, has indexed these uh, records. The index is available online. So when you go to the index, you can search to see if there is somebody uh, that you know. And for purposes of this one, we're going to use John on Adams here, who is initiated in 1911, he dies in 1925. That claim number all the way over here in the last column is an important number because we're going to be able to take that number and we're going to be able to go to the Family Search website and we're going to just type in Foresters as our example, uh, just the keyword there, and we get a list of hits one of which is going to be the important list of individuals for the Massachusetts Forester Mortuary Records. It's actually below this particular screen, but there are only 79 results, so it's not really tough here, but you can see some of the variations there. Uh, as you know, Family Search has been digitizing a lot of records, so as we get to the Massachusetts Forester Mortuary Records uh, from 1880 to 1935, down below, you're going to, where it says film notes, there's also formatting and we're going to scroll down until we find the, the claim group that includes our 11634. And that's going to take us to the digitized records, which are not indexed. So you can't just type in a name. You have to go this route and then look for it. And as we go through them, we ultimately will find John F. Adams and his images with a front card that tells us about him. In his file, there were 15 images, including medical exams, application, and a death record and a beneficiary receipt. His application includes his parents' names and where he was born and when he was born. 
his medical exam is going to, uh, so he's got his father's name in full, his mother's name in full, etc. His medical exam, because it's an insurance company uh, aspect to this, includes his siblings and what they may have had illness-wise. So again, now I know certain items about them and that he has various uh, living and deceased siblings. So you can search for those. You can also do searches in the catalogs just under occupations. Um, in this case, the Ancient Order of United Workmen, because it was an occupation trade type society, it, they put it under occupation societies, and they have the death registers for the Grand Lodge of Kansas, which allows us to see that we can find our people who are unfortunately dying, but it gives us the uh, location, the name of the lodge, again, the important thing you need, the cause of death, when they joined, the date of death, and then this happened to be a two-page spread, and on the second page, we had information about the person's occupation, and some of the information about their proceeds that, that they had, their payments that they made, but who was going to get paid, their beneficiary and their, rela their relationship. So in some situations, you'll get that, especially like down here, we have Hulda and Alma who are a child and a grandchild. Other things that you may find along the way, and this is literally just hit and miss, are things like this endowment uh, rank here of an assessment for the Knights of Pythias, which gives us the names and causes of death and when they died. Ancestry has many records that they've begun to digitize as well, including Sons of Italy especially. Uh, so you can check that out both by putting in Sons of Italy and getting them for whatever states exist. Big tip here, keep in mind that when it comes to those ethnic organizations, they're probably gonna be in the language of the old country because that was one of the things and they still do that today. So as an example, you'll see in this Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, it is completely in Italian. So Alvin, who is the applicant is giving us information, but the entire form is written in Italian and his, uh, Parents' names may be in Italian, places may be in Italian, et cetera. So keep that in mind if you're dealing with any of those. Also, when it comes to reading, uh, when it comes to the applications themselves, especially for the auxiliaries, you want to read them. You want to see what the qualifications for membership are because it could be as, as far removed as grandchildren or adopted children, et cetera. So they have various specific uh, requirements there as to the auxiliaries and who could join. So in review, we're going to want to talk, you know, look at what you've got, family heirlooms, pictures of gravestones, etc. Turn to those published sources we talked about to identify your organization and then see what records may exist with the lodge, either local or state. Uh, they are the best to start your contact information with. And keep in mind that if they don't have insurance, they're only going to pretty much give you name, age, residence, the date they joined, and any death information or when they left the organization. It's only the insurance ones that are going to give you any family history. All right. Thank you, Rhonda, for your presentation. So now uh, let's tackle your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, please go ahead and type it in the questions panel, and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time provided. We're quickly running out of time, but we can extend it for a few minutes for to answer some of your questions. Um, so one of the questions that came up in um, a few of the emails that were sent to me before the webinar, um, people had reached out to some of the local lodges and had no response. What do you suggest uh, they do next? Um, is there, is it going to kind of the next level in the hierarchy? Is it going to the lodge and knocking on the door? Um, what do you, what do you suggest? First thing, don't go to the lodge and knock on the door. Uh, that's probably not the best approach. First off, think about how you asked your question. If you ask for, for family information, they probably just blew you off. Approach it from a membership standpoint. 
because again, that's what these places have. But keep in mind that these are private records and they don't have to share with you. Many of them are becoming aware that it, genealogists you know, are hungry for this information, are a little more willing to share, uh, but it may have come down to if you were asking for family information. If you've checked with the local lodge, you might go up to the state level. Uh, also go to the, both the state website and the national website and see what kind of uh, libraries or museums they may have. They may also have somebody who handles genealogical requests uh, just as part of their day-to-day -day, uh, job. All right, and um, now Marna asks, is there a way to determine what state your family member joined under? You know, in, in her case, her ancestor moved around a lot, um, you know, sometimes living overseas, coming back. Do you have any suggestions on how to determine um, even where or what state that local lodge is? That can be a tough one. I mean, uh hopefully you've got some clue or if you know where your person was you know build a timeline for your guy obviously if he's overseas that's unlikely uh, for societies that he's joining here in the US even if they have uh, international arms uh, but I would look at the you know a timeline of where he is uh, you know any given year and see what lodges exist uh, and then see which ones are still prevalent. Usually he's going to, uh, even if he hasn't joined in a particular lodge, their card will say where he joined at. So as he moves from place to place, there's, there's probably some, he's got to prove that he's a member. He can't just show up and say, here I am. He has to prove he's a member. So even a local lodge will have some indication. So you might be able to backtrack it that way. Also, how common, this was kind of a, a question that came up as well, um, how common was it for people to belong to multiple organizations? Uh, it was very common. Uh, some of them would do maybe one or two, as we saw with that one tombstone, but then I have what I dubbed the joiners, uh, and they may join four, five, six organizations. Uh, I commend them for their time that they have to spend with all these groups. Uh, but usually you'll see that maybe they have, uh, we had somebody who had emailed us and there was one who had a, like the AOUW, which is an occupational or a trade. Then there was a patriotic group with the degree of honor. Uh, and then the tribe of Ben-Hur, which is actually based on a, based on the book Ben-Hur. So, and it's a life insurance. So they may have joined different groups to get different, different pieces of what they wanted. All right, so it looks like there are a number of questions about uh, specific websites that we mentioned, um, how to review the recording. Um, following uh, our live broadcast here, I will be posting this to our website and then sending a follow-up email with a link. Um, so you can always go back and you can review that recording, you can pause it, you can um, take, you know, you can do the print screen and take screenshots uh, while you're watching the recording as well. Um, so if you've missed anything, don't worry, don't despair, you'll be able to go back and capture that information. So if you'd like more hands-on with your research, um, certainly consider scheduling a consultation with one of our experts or even hiring our research services team. And if you're interested in learning more about those services, you can write to the email addresses on the current slide. So thank you all again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll be you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org education. And I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.